Welcome, welcome to the village. Hey, my name's Eric. Uh, welcome to the village. It's good to see all of you here today. Uh, we are in a series, or really in a part two of a series called Healing. Now, the reason that we have started this series uh, on healing is because we kind of want to keep pointing back to really the main purpose of our community, the thing that drives us, the thing that defines us, and that is this little phrase that goes, healing the city one person at a time, that our community is about engaging one another in healing, and we believe that healing comes when we gather together around Jesus, that if a community gathers around Jesus, that healing happens, um, and that it really does happen one person at a time, and, and to kind of illustrate that and to to learn how to be disciples of Jesus and offer healing over, uh, basically between January and Easter, we have been looking at stories of healing in the Gospels. And we've been looking at Jesus' engagement with people who come to him and ask for healing. And we've been, in particular, looking at how he does it, what he says, what he talks about, so that we could be imitators of Jesus in that way. But then also, because we're people who need healing, who need to be healed, and I'll just pause right here and say, when we're talking about healing, we are talking about physical healing, so we're talking about our body being healed. We're talking about the healing of our soul, which is our personality. And hey, face it, all of us need uh, some healing in our souls. In our personalities are a little bit broken. Um, healing in our emotions or our hearts. When we talk about the healing of our heart, we're talking about our emotions. And, and we know with all the wacko chemicals firing in our body and our anger issues and all those kinds of things, that we struggle um, with our emotions. And there's a healing that needs to happen. And then... Uh, last but not least, our minds need to be healed, right? Romans 12, 2 tells us that there has to be a renewing of our minds because we get so caught up in what the world has to say and there's a bro- there are broken loops in our brain where we just kind of get caught in, in, in wrong thinking that drives us down towards wrong emotions. And it's just, it's a mess. So we need healing. So that's what we're talking about. And we're all in deep need of it. Um, And so we look at these people who approach Jesus and whom Jesus approaches for healing. And and how did they respond? How did the paralytic respond when his sins are forgiven and when he's healed? Um, And so we're looking at those kinds of things. We did that all the way up to Easter, and we looked at the ultimate healing, which is the resurrection. Now, if you could imagine that sort of as physiology 101, like the the basics of, of how healing works, we're in physiology 102 for the next five weeks, which is just kind of... Uh, maybe looking at the anatomy of healing and maybe getting some more specifics as to how you and I might go about offering it and really understanding its connections um, to Jesus and how Jesus engages people and what his purposes are in healing and all those kinds of things. Um, So last week what I said was that blessing is the main route to healing. That when you and I offer a blessing to people, that's how healing begins to happen, when we bless other people. And what I said blessing was, basically it's sort of a three-part idea that really, if you look at Scripture, this is kind of what blessing is. And that is that, number one, it's really seeing someone. Really seeing someone. When we're talking about really seeing someone, we're talking about recognizing them as an image bearer of Jesus. We're talking about recognizing them as an image bearer of Jesus, which is a huge, important idea because what happens in our culture and happens within ourselves is that we remove people's humanity and then it's easy for us to judge them, to ignore them, to push them aside. So the first way of blessing someone and healing someone and offering healing of Jesus is to reestablish their humanity, their image bearing in the eyes, in your eyes, as having and having Jesus as a filter in that. And so that's number one. Number two, as we think about blessing, the second thing you need to do is, is blessing is about knowing somebody, about knowing their story, the thing that brings them to the point that they are, the thing that, that makes them tick the way they tick, the thing that makes them do the annoying things that you can't handle or the broken choices that they make or, or just the way they relate or their little OCD things, all those kinds of things are the things Um, that that are connected to their story. Their story is what gives those things meaning and substance and really helps us have compassion. When you know somebody's story and you see them as human and as an image bearer, you begin to have compassion on them. And one of the keys to healing is compassion. 
Now, number three, the third part of blessing is just simply calling people out. And when we talk about calling people out, we're really talking about naming somebody, giving them a name. And when we talk about giving them a name, we're talking about saying, hey, this is who Jesus has created you to be. This is who Jesus has created you to be. Now, what I said was, as people, it's become very difficult for us to bless one another because I, I offered you Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, which talks about, Jesus talks about having a log in your eye. And, the, and, and so you're constantly trying to take the speck out of other people's eye, but you get this huge log in your eye, which is just smack, smacking them around. And so I have the kids, our, our mid kids, which are our 9 to 12 year olds, they're in the, in the service three times out of the month. And so they have an interactive page with the sermon. And one of the things that they do is uh, I give them opportunities to draw pictures and their art gets displayed and helps me review things and make points the next week. And in this particular, um, assignment, I have them draw me with a log in my eye. And so I love this differently. They got the one, my favorite one up here is the one where I'm screaming and then Pastor Rod saying, what's wrong with you? And I got a big old log in my eye. It's pretty funny. Um, but, but the idea here is, in Matt, that Jesus is trying to communicate, is that we don't, we're unable to bless people. We're really unable to offer healing to the speck in their eye because we have this log. And so I, I explained to you what the log was by bringing you to the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, where humanity finds itself in a place where it wants to build a tower because it wants to build a name for itself. And not only that, it wants to be able to see the tower and stay together and not be dispersed. Okay, so, so within that tower building and 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 not wanting to be disturbed, dispersed gives actually it shows us two very important longings that live within us. One is to be important, and the other is to be safe. Or as Larry Crabb says, to be significant or to be secure. Or as other people might say, to be loved or to be um, recognized or important or have meaning and purpose and have an impact. Um, but these two, thi- these two things exist in us and they're good and they're something that actually I believe got put inside us long before the fall as part of our image bearing to, to, to find, to be secure and to have importance. Now, the log in our eye is the fact that we have been unwilling to accept what God has given us in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, which is God has told humanity at the beginning of creation you are important you are significant and here's why you bear the image of the living god we are image bearers that's what makes us significant that's what makes us important and not only that god sends out humanity in what we call the cultural mandate to go he blesses us and says go bless he gives you a job and 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 when god gives you a job and gives you his image you have meaning and you're going to be taken care of but we we're unwilling to take our significance and and safety, our, our our love and impact from God. Like that, we 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 refuse to do that. So we want to take hold of it and make it our own. But then, not only that, you you go all the way to to the cross, and what do we have? And this is what's so awesome about the God of the Hebrews and the God of of Christians, of followers of Jesus, is that the God of the universe gets his hands messy. God becomes a human, fully God, fully man, and he pours himself out in what we would call kenosis. He empties himself. It's a theological word, but it's an emptying. He, The God of the universe fully empties himself for us. If that doesn't say you're important, significant, loved, and and have impact, then then what... What does? But we, we look at that and say, no, no, that can't be true. That can't be true. I have to figure out what I do and what I build to make me significant. And so Jesus tells us that the only way that we can offer blessing to other people, see, know, and call them out, is if we're willing to remove the log, which is to push aside the things that make us significant and the things that make us love, the thing that we think we need, and really embrace Jesus in those things, and take God at his word when he says that we're important because we bear his image and have a mission given to us by the God of the universe, right? To hold on to those things. Now, tonight what I want to do is just take a look um, at blessing, and the importance of blessing, and how we might 
go about doing this as we take as we take the log out of our own eye. Now, I want to take us tonight to Galatians chapter three, which is on uh, page eleven fifty two in your black Bibles. Uh, in Galatians fifty, Galatians three. Um, it is kind of harsh, so you, you gotta just. It might. I, let me give you a a a little bit of a heads up. Paul is an apostle of Jesus, and he wrote Galatians chapter three, and he's he's one of the prolific writers of the New Testament, and he's been beat up. He's been. I mean, Paul has gone through the ringer. So when you begin to press against the gospel, the main thing that drives Paul, he does gets a little peeved. And you're going to see how this plays itself out. So it says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Would you? I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Now here's the thing that's really important there that I just want to stop and, and point out is that what he's saying is, and maybe you just don't know this, but if you're a follower of Jesus, the Spirit of God has been given to you. Now, now that should just blow your mind just slightly. Should blow your mind just slightly. In that, <laughs> what is being said here is that when you believe what is heard, the God of the universe comes to dwell with you, in you and on you, in you to work out your salvation on you to go out and offer the gospel. And so that should just blow your mind in itself. And what Paul is saying is, did you get the Spirit of God because of all the work you did or because of what you heard? After being with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? If really was, if it really was for nothing, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard. Now he's going to tell us about this ancient guy, verse 6. Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So he believed, and God offered him rightness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scriptures first saw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, we could go on here, and there's lovely uh, stuff about covenant here, and lovely stuff about Abraham, and, and how he integrates within the, our faith, and what, what's important there with, with a, being Hebrew, and having the double father of Abraham. It's all very interesting. But that's not what I want to talk about Right now, what I want to talk about is that what's being said here is that if you are someone who believes and heard about the crucified and risen Jesus and you believe, then you are a great, 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 great grandchild of Abraham and that Abraham is your grandfather. Now, here's the thing about grandpas. Grandpas love to tell stories and it's good. Fathers love to tell stories. Mothers love to tell stories. Or you should if you don't. And I love to hear my father's stories. Now, my father was a Vietnam vet. He was a vice principal in Miami High School. He made deals with drug dealers to stay off his campuses. He, he, he has lots of interesting stories about danger and adventure in Vietnam. My dad has good stories. What's interesting about those stories, of which I like to hear over and over again, is one very simple thing. It roots me in. It gives me meaning. It gives me purpose. But it also says there's a path, a, a way to go, uh, things to avoid. That that my name has a meaning. Right? And so what I want to do tonight is I want to take you to Father Abraham's or Grandpa Abraham's story in Genesis chapter 12. And, and we're really only going to talk about this little bit of the story that Paul references. Um, and I, I want to do all of this in the context of blessing, right? Because it says here that you and I are the product of Abraham's obedience or his faith and that 
we are part of his blessing, right? That, that because he believed, you and I are blessed with belief. Right? We become his children, Abraham's blessing. That's what you, you and I are. And so if that's true, then however Abraham approached this should give us some clues on how you and I should offer that blessing that, that is given, given to Abraham. And I suspect then that you and I are called to give. Now, it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram. Now, Abram is his, is his name. Abraham is the name given to him in Genesis chapter 17, of which we will address next week. So we'll stick with Abram. And it says, so the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Okay? Go to the land I will show you. Now, I just want you to hear what's happened here. I I don't know how Abram hears God, but God speaks to him in a way where he says, look, you need to leave your nation. You need to leave your people. You need to leave your family and go to a place I will show you. Now, do you hear what's happening? God is saying, look, people, look, Abram, Abram, look, you need to leave the thing that makes you important, the thing that keeps you safe, right? The thing that what? Makes you significant. The thing that gives you safety. The thing that where you offer an impact, where you know that you're loved, where you have an identity. And go to a place that I show you. That I show you. Now, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Now, the writer of Proverbs wants us to know that a lot of times the things that God asks us to do feels uncomfortable, and actually feels like it doesn't make sense to us, that there's a disconnect. We're like, wait, 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 wait. But this is the thing that makes me feel important. This is family. This is this is the good stuff. We're like, hmm, don't undo that. Doesn't make sense. But the writer of Proverbs says, if you lean on God's understanding and not on your understanding, if you acknowledge him, like if in your ways he is the center of things, the path will be straight. It may not make sense to you, but your path will be straight. You're not going to stumble. And so what happens here? If you jump down to verse 4, and we, we need to know this, it says in verse 4, so Abram left and the Lord, as the Lord had told him. So Abram does it. He leaves. He leaves even though he does not know where he's going. He does not know what kind of people he will become or end up with. He doesn't know how he's going to be, what kind of meaning he's going to, he's, he's entrusting everything to Jesus, I mean to God. And so think about this with faith. Faith is not how you feel emotionally about an idea. Most of the time, when I am following Jesus, the things that Jesus is asking me to do don't make me feel good inside. Like they, they feel antithetical to, to what is safe for me and the things that make me important. So, so, Abram, Abram leaves, even though, and he leaves into uncertainty because he trusts God. And the reason we know he has faith is because he did it, not because of how. It doesn't say, oh, and he felt good, so good about this. He just did it. He went and he obeyed. Now, here is kind of what God tells Abram as to what's going to happen to him as he goes along. And in this list of blessings and experiences with with God, we can learn what it looks like for you and I to offer blessing and to be blessed by God. Okay? So so verse 2, it says, I will make you into a great nation. Now, to make somebody is to fashion or to shape somebody. Now, a lot of times you and I have these great experiences with God and we're like, all right, here we go. And, and, and I'm going to do a great thing for God. And so God calls you somewhere. He calls you into relationship with your wife in a deeper way. He calls you into a church that might make you uncomfortable. He calls you into a city where you feel disconnected. He calls you to a neighbor that scares you. He calls you to do something new and big. He calls you to be a quiet and soft parent instead of an angry man. He's calling you to something that's moving you out of your significance and out of your um, safety, the things that you have 
carefully fashioned. And you then begin to believe, I can do this. I can do it. I'm going to go make it. But what does God say to Abram? He says, I will fashion. I will make you a great nation. I will do it. You just have to be available. Your choice is availability. God is the transformer. God is about a mission. And how willing is Abraham to be part of that mission? God is fashioning Abraham into a nation. And if Abraham makes, Abraham makes himself available, God fashions him into a nation. So this is important. When you head out to offer things, don't think, I gotta do this. Think, God, I'm ready to have you do this to me. And then God says to, to Abram, and I will bless you. Now bless is an interesting word. Um, it's all through the Bible, right, to bless somebody. But it's actually an odd word in, in the ancient Hebrew, and that is that it doesn't indicate what senses it engages within the language, within the way it's written, which is a very common kind of thing. Um, when you write a word in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, it, like you can figure out which kind of how this particular word engages the senses at some level. But, but blessing doesn't. So the question is how do you figure that out? Well, what, what scholars have kind of concluded is that there's, there's an idea of complete surrendering, right? There's a giving up of power. So when the God of the universe says, I'm going to fashion you as a nation and I'm going to bless you, well, what he's saying is I'm going to bequeath some of my power to you. I'm going to give you what, like, God stuff. And it's not just like, hey, a king way over you. He's What he's saying here, and this is an important thing, is I'm going to get down on your level, and I'm going to get nitty-gritty with you, and we're, we're going to do this together, and I'm going to give you what you need. That's what the blessing of God is about. And you and I, well, to go back to what I said earlier, we experienced this as followers of Jesus. How did God become nitty-gritty with us? He became a man. Jesus, fully God, fully man, dying on the cross for our sins, raising from the dead, giving us hope of life everlasting. Right? He got nitty-gritty. He humbled himself. He, he got in the dirt and the mud with us. Now, so when we leave, the first part is that there's a shaping of us. And then we have, and God's saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this stuff with you. And then the second part of this verse says, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Right? Was important to an ancient person because name me is a meaning. Now, Abram has a name and it means something. And then he's gonna get a new name and that's gonna mean something different or a newer way of thinking about Abram. And as ancient ancient people, names are important. They say who you are. Now, I, I made a board game um, over Lent. Now, I have worked on this board game for a long time, but I decided to try to get published, and I got published by a self-publishing company. It's, uh, it's cool. The game looks amazing. But I designed the game for, for kids between 9 to 12, but it's really fun for adults too. But the idea is you're a character, and you're in a forest, and you're hunting around the forest, fighting monsters, rescuing humans, getting weapons... Make building your character. And, and the game is designed to force you to cooperate with each other and, and help each other out on missions and make sacrifices and do those kinds of things to make it all work. But um, in the game, you come across thing, wisdom things. And, and wisdom, you have to read these wisdom cards. And one of the wisdom cards is, is based on 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, and, and let me read that to you and show you how it's connected to this uh, passage. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it's connected to the, the passage the card is in the game, and it, it's connected to Genesis here, and this idea of Genesis 12, Abram, and the new name, and God making a new name for him. It says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Okay, now this is this is a super important idea, because when you become a follower of Jesus, um, you become a new creature. Right? So in the board game that I designed, um, when you get this wisdom card, what you're forced to do is take a card of a different character that isn't being played and replace it with your character, which transforms the way you built the character. And so you've got to then readjust. And it's frustrating to little kids, and I love it. It's just a fun element within the game.
But um, but in reality here, this is what God is telling Abram. He's like, I'm going to make you a new creation. And in that new creation, the old Abram is gone and the new Abram is here. Now, what's interesting about this idea in, in the Greek, I mean, there's some debate about this, but most likely this is what's being said here in the Greek, if you read it in its real, original language, is that the old has gone and the old is going, and the new has come and the new is going. Right? Because you and I both know that we all have a bunch of junk still. Even if we're followers of Jesus, the junk is still going away and the new stuff is still coming. So there's this reality that Paul's writing about, and he wants everybody to kind of understand that though those two things are happening to you simultaneously as you follow Jesus, in Christ, as the God of the universe looks at you through him, you the old is gone and the new has come. Now what's fascinating about this uh, passage in Genesis is that God says, I'm going to fashion, I'm going to make you a new creation, basically. I'm going to give you a new name, and you're going to bless people. That through this new name, you are going to be a blessing to other people. Now, I think no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus, you're you're still in this process of becoming a new creature. And the key is that if if you're going to walk in Father Abraham's footsteps, if you're going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, then as you become a new creature, people need to know and experience your new creatureness. So if you're, if God is shaping you to be more kind, then people need to experience your kindness. If God is redeeming you out of your brokenness and, and the woundedness that you experience, then people need to hear the good and exciting stories of what God is doing in your life. Because you see, when I hear stories like Vivi's and Lane's, when I hear your stories, what happens is my spirit, the spirit of God in me, resonates with your spirit, and I'm like, whoa, I'm excited about what God's doing. And I begin to realize that God's fashioning in me too a new name and, and I'm becoming a new creature. And, and as stories are told of our fall and our redemption, all of those things, as Jesus has entered into our life and as we become new creatures, this is the way we bless people, by allowing the new creature to be shown in community. Allowing your neighbor and your workmate, allowing your children and your husband and your wife, allowing your roommates to experience... New creatureness. <sighs> Allowing people to experience new creatureness. It's key. Now, verse 3 it says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, I want to walk backwards here. It says that all people on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, I don't know if you remember or any of you even know, but the, the Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. And, and if you read all the way through Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, at the end, Jesus gives out a commission to his disciples. He sends them, much like Abraham, and he says, go. Um, and in that going... The idea is that the blessing of God will go to all nations. That really this, Genesis chapter 12 and Matthew 28 are connected and that they are, Matthew 28 is a continuation of the blessing given to Abraham. That the whole world will be blessed through Abraham's faith and that you and I are children of Abraham because we heard and believed. And all who hear and believe are children of Abraham. And so all the world is blessed. Now as Abraham... Abram goes out to do this mission as he obeys. What he has is that this obedience is going to be a blessing to all nations, to the world. But this sounds like a really big project, and it gets bigger and bigger as it's laid out in this blessing. Right? And that how is this going to work? Now, what's interesting is it's probably in Abram's mind that look. People are going to come against me. This is going to be dangerous, right? This is going to threaten my security. And, and so Abram, Jesus, or God tells Abram, I'll curse who curses you. But really, I mean, that seems a little harsh, but it makes a lot of sense as, a, as an ancient person. But all he's really saying is, you're not going to go it alone, right? Matthew 28, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm sending to the, you to the end of the age, but I will, or, I'm sending you out to the ends of the earth, but I will be with you to the end of the age. Like, I'm not going to abandon you. I will be with you. 
And here is, that's what God is telling Abram. I'm not going to abandon you. I will be with you. I will be in this fight with you. I will be in this journey with you. I am not going anywhere. Now, this is key because as you and I go out to offer blessing to others, as we want to see people, know people, and call them out, there will be opposition both in human and spiritual world, and we need to know that God will not abandon us. Now, here's what I want you to hold on to tonight. Number one. If you are walking and following Jesus and you are not uncomfortable in any way, that you don't feel like God, what God is asking you to do, the things that you see in the circumstances you're experiencing are not pushing you spiritually out of your comfort zone, out of your significance and security in life, the things that you've created, the idols that you've developed, if those are not being pushed over at any level, then you are not following Jesus. Because Jesus is a loving God who offers peace, but Jesus is a disruptive God to our worship. If Our worship is not focused on him, and it isn't ever fully focused on him. And so there's always a disruptive element that God, where he's going after our significance and our security that we are developing on our own without him and not through him. Okay, so That's number one. Number two, you're not following Jesus if you're not making yourself available. People are not experiencing the blessing and you're not experiencing God's blessing if you're not making yourself available for transformation, for God to empty himself into you, to God to give you his power. So you've got to say, okay, I'm going to make myself available. If you are so caught up in trying to get it right, then you're not experiencing the grace of Jesus. The grace of Jesus is saying, I can't get it right. I will believe that what you've offered is true and I will make myself available for you to tinker, to transform, to fashion me into a new creature. Now, here's how you know that you're blessing people. Here's the way to see people. Is that as you are transformed and become a new creature, it is easier for you to offer people humanity and to know their story and to offer them compassion and then to have the eyes of Jesus to see them. So you need to be telling people what God is doing in your life and then exercising the qualities that are being fashioned into your life as you become a new creature and you need to take hold of the fact that the old is gone and the new has come. And last but not least, the thing that I want you to hold on to as you risk offering healing to people through blessing them by seeing them and knowing them and calling them out is very simple. I want you to hold on to the fact that Jesus will not abandon you. He is with you. We follow a God who gets dirty. We follow a God who walks with his people. We follow a God who understands fully on the cross all of our suffering, who feels the weight of things, that even though he can raise Lazarus, he weeps. Remember this story before Easter? God raises Lazarus from the dead, but before that he weeps. Well, he can raise him from the dead, but he understands the curse. He understands the weight of death. He knows us deeply, and he died for us, and he poured his life out for us, and that is vital for us to understand. Now we're running out of time. So I'm going to pray. Father, thank you so much um, for today. And thank you for this community. And I pray that you would help us to be a people of blessing. And I said in your name, Jesus. Amen.